My name is Scott Chaloner and you are listening to the Leaders' Council podcast for the people who run the country and the people who keep the country running. As our regular listeners will know here on the Leaders' Council podcast, part of our mission is to bring forward a variety of distinct perspectives on leadership. And on today's show, that mission takes us to faraway China, where we'll be hearing from Jamie Dixon, coach, trainer and author, And we'll be talking a lot about the release of his latest book, The Story Habit, which is said to be a manual of the mind for leaders. Uh, Jamie, a very warm welcome to yourself this morning, of course, and by all means, thank you for joining us. I imagine it's a little bit later in the day where you are. Uh, Yes, it's uh, mid-afternoon right now, yes. And thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure, Jamie. So um, first and foremost, I think just to contextualise for those listeners that might not be familiar with you. So you're a coach, trainer and author, of course, very sort of basic outline of what you do. But you've been working a lot with sort of real ambitious leaders in even multinational organisations over the uh, the last 10 years. So um, could you tell me a little bit more about that sort of work that you've been doing? Mm. Yeah, so as a British person based in China, um, and I'm also a Mandarin speaker. Uh, so a lot of the work I do is with uh, leaders in multinational companies here, a lot of Chinese leaders in particular. And uh, the, the area that I, I've, uh, I get called in for a, a lot is for Chinese leaders who are struggling to influence, um, especially on the international stage. Uh, and there tend to be a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one obviously is cultural differences. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, as I'm sure a lot of people are aware, Chinese tend to be a bit more indirect, um, not so assertive. Um, but another reason, more recently as well, is uh, you know political differences are starting to have an impact, uh, especially on the beliefs of their colleagues overseas, and those beliefs are not always. Um, so aligned with the reality on the ground over here. And so it can be very, very difficult for these leaders over here to explain what's actually happening on the ground here uh, to people who have completely different beliefs about about what's happening. So I, I, I work with a lot of leaders who, who are struggling in, in these kinds of areas. Yeah, and I can imagine, obviously, that sort of being immersed in the Chinese culture as well, that sort of thinking, that philosophy, that pragmatism, I can imagine that's probably had an impact on sort of your own coaching style to an extent, hasn't it, as well? Uh, Yes, absolutely. Um, One of the things about Chinese people is that they're they're an incredibly practical people, uh, and... uh, more more of an influence on, on, the, on the kind of training and coaching that I do is their expectations for practicality. Uh, coaching is sometimes viewed quite differently over here. I, I remember uh, I used to work for Amway China and I remember um, speaking to some of the leaders who were who the distributors for Amway and explaining coaching to them and uh, they responded so I pay all of this money uh, just for people, just for a coach to ask me questions, um, and, and the idea of you know helping you think things through uh, was was a little bit alien. So um, they have very high demands on on outcomes and, and getting very very practical. And for example, in the training room, um, they they don't really have much patience for theory um, concepts things like that. They, uh, they want results. They have problems and they want to solve problems. Uh, and so it's really encouraged me to be a, a very, very practical uh, when, when I'm coaching and training people. Yeah, I can certainly um, imagine so. And going on to um, your sort of upcoming book, the, uh, the Story Habit, which you sort of briefly talked about in the, uh, the introduction uh, to the program. Um, I suppose... When people sort of ask the question, why story habits? Um, It's because skills are fundamentally built on them. And one simple story habit, let's say, that is of great help to sort of the skill of telling a story is to sort of notice change, isn't it? And when we talk about storytelling training, Jamie, um, why, when we sort of integrate that into the way we lead, should it not be a complicated thing? Because people can look at this and think, oh, it's a very sort of this, that, and the other. It seems very, very complicated. It seems very complex, but that's really not the reality, is it? Yeah, it's uh, it's really not the reality. I remember when I was first approached for 
uh, for storytelling trainings and coaching. And, uh, you know, the field of storytelling was quite new to me at that time. And I went out to, to research a lot about it and, uh, and to see what other kind of training programs there were. And uh, I, I saw a lot of these training programs and a lot of books as well talking about models such as the hero's journey. And the hero's journey, for those people who are not familiar, you know, the idea is a uh, regular person starts off in their regular life. Something horrible happens. They have to go on a journey. Through that journey, they overcome lots of challenges, and those challenges make them into a hero. And eventually, they return um, to their home as a hero. And um, a lot of the, the, the books and trainings that I saw about uh, storytelling at the time were about uh, were about how to use uh, the hero's journey uh, to brush up your monthly reports, which just seemed like absolute overkill. Mm. Um, there's no need to overcomplicate things. And as I as I researched more into it, um, I realized that storytelling is ultimately about making meaning. Um, that's all it is. It's just about making meaning. Uh, and uh, the reason we use storytelling to make meaning is because stories uh, tend to do a very, very good job of making meaning. Uh, but there's more to storytelling than just telling stories. Um, uh, one aspect of it is understanding the stories that people believe in and then working with those stories to influence what they believe in, uh, which is a particularly big challenge that uh, uh, a lot of the, the leaders I work with here in China face. So if I give an example, I've worked with a lot of uh, Western companies who are very, very reluctant to sell on Chinese e-commerce platforms, like, for example, Tmall. Mm. Um, one example is a, uh, a European coffee uh, machine company. Um, I'm sure a lot of people can guess who they were. Uh, but the, the, the staff I was working with in Shanghai, uh, they were telling their headquarters in Europe that if we want to sell more coffee machines, we have to go on Tmall. Tmall is like somewhat the equivalent of Amazon uh, in China. And the uh, the headquarters in Europe, they were saying, well, we don't want to go on Tmall because we don't want to be on a platform that sells counterfeit products. Plus, we have a website. And if people want to buy our coffee machine, uh, they can buy on the website. And there are two problems with those beliefs. One is actually there aren't that many counterfeit products being sold on Tmall these days. That's from a lot of um, from a much earlier time, that obviously left a deep impression on them. Mm. Uh, but two is in China, no one really uses websites anymore, uh, and so the Chinese staff had a really difficult time persuading their headquarters to allow them to uh, to sell on these uh, on these Chinese e-commerce platforms. And so that that is not so much about telling telling stories but it's about shaping the stories that people believe in. Mm. And to do that in the process, obviously you may tell some stories, but uh, you may also have to do some other things that influence the stories that, that they believe in. Maybe showing them some things, for example, letting them experience things, uh, for example. Uh, so working not just with the words you say, but also the conditions surrounding people so that you can start to shape what they believe about the situation. So s telling stories and also shaping stories, I suppose you could use both things to actually solve real problems that leaders and businesses are facing, can't you? Because like I say, if you go in and intervene, for instance, with the, uh, the Timo anecdote that you talked about and sort of challenge those beliefs, make them sort of see that, you know, this might be beneficial to the company, you know, that could have ended far, far better for the firm in question, couldn't it? Yes. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that need to be done to, to persuade people. One of the most, uh, sure. Um, w one of the most effective things is actually letting people experience things for themselves. Uh, and with a lot of the companies I've worked with, they have found that their, their foreign colleagues, as soon as they come on a trip to China, they suddenly get it. <laughs> they suddenly realize why things are done this way and why, you know, all of their plans that they've been putting in motion from Europe haven't been working effectively over here. 
uh, experiencing is uh, is probably the most powerful way of actually shaping people's beliefs. And ironically, experiencing is actually actually has a kind of parallel with storytelling as well. There's a very key principle in storytelling called show don't tell. And with show don't tell, you are well when you read a story. The story is creating pictures in your mind. It's creating images in your mind. So, for example, instead of saying my boss was angry, you would describe my boss threw his laptop out of the window. That is showing because you're using words that paint pictures in people's minds. And a good story will always show instead of tell you what happened because that helps people imagine what's going on. And there's parallels with experience because by showing, you're targeting the senses. You're speaking to their eyes, their ears, things they can physically experience. Um, and it works exactly the same way when you are trying to persuade people. If you let people experience things for themselves, all of a sudden it becomes a lot easier for them to relate to you than just telling them. So I, I've, uh, you know, one of the things I find really interesting about storytelling is if you do think of storytelling as the language of the mind, you can pick out the skills that a, that a good story will use. You can find other ways of using these skills. So, uh, yeah, stories great at using vivid language to show instead of tell, but you can also apply this principle of showing, not telling in so many other ways by, for example, letting people experience things. Uh, so there's a lot of application to, to storytelling when, when you look a lot deeper. Yeah. And they say there are three ingredients to a good story, don't they? So what, sort of ingredients from your perspective, Jamie, would they be to sort of making it as effective as it can be? So, um, you know, in my book, The Story Habit, um, the three ingredients that I talk about, one is show, don't tell, which, uh, you know, which I I just described. That's about talking to the senses Mm. instead of the intellect because we always experience things through our senses before it goes to the intellect. So that's one of the ingredients. Another ingredient is, is contrast. So if I give an example, uh, if I say uh, last month we sold uh, 143 units, that on its own doesn't mean anything at all. But if I say on average each month we sell two units, now we have a contrast. And when we have a contrast, suddenly there's meaning. Uh, And this relates to what you were saying earlier about noticing change. Uh, a contrast is essentially a change. When you can see this contrasted with this, there is a change going on here. And when there is a change, there is a story. And you'll notice any kind of story is about change. A story is never, you know, I woke up, I got on the subway, I went to work, I got on the subway back home, I went to bed. It's never about something normal. It's always about change. And so... Uh, Earlier on, you mentioned that habit of noticing change. A great habit if you want to develop stories is to notice changes that happen in your everyday life. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, maybe you got on the subway and then it was delayed. Um, and it was delayed because there was a power failure. And then you started chatting with the people next to you and you discovered all these really interesting people that you wouldn't have otherwise discovered. When there are changes, there are new stories for us to discover. And so when you notice change, you can remember that change. You start to build a story pool in your mind and you have all of these stories that you can access and use any time. Uh, and so contrast uh, is all about showing a change or a difference in your story or, or, or even uh, if you're presenting facts and statistics, like I mentioned earlier, 143 units, you contrast it with something else you show a change and that change then gives meaning. Another um, ingredient is using analogies and metaphors. Uh, and, and metaphors are actually a really big part of our, our, our everyday language. Mm. Um, we use them all the time. And a, a good example is just talking about, uh, about the stock market. You know, the Fed is, is going to ease the supply of money and you know, share prices are going to rise. When we talk about 
ease the supply of money, that gives the kind of feeling of like a lake with water and, and a dam um, easing the supply of water. And uh, that's not actually what's happening with uh, uh, with the supply of money. It's just a metaphor to help us get that meaning. And the same with um, the share prices rising. They don't physically rise. That's, again, another metaphor mm. that makes us think of things going up. And it's a really um, important part of storytelling is using metaphors in, in your story. Uh, and that could be using simple little examples that help people relate to what you're talking about. Um, or it could be the whole story is a metaphor for, for something uh, to really help stimulate thoughts. So three ingredients that I talk about in the story habit, show, don't tell, contrast, and uh, metaphors and analogies. Yeah, fantastic. And um, we've talked about obviously storytelling, but also shaping stories as well earlier on in the uh, the discussion. Is there a fundamental difference between the two that they need to be aware of, or are the two very much interchangeable? Would you say? I uh, so for me, the difference between telling stories and shaping stories. Uh, obviously, you are doing different things with telling stories. You are literally talking with shaping stories. It's more about everything that you can do to influence what they believe in. But there are so many things in common um, between these two things. And uh, I have a framework called Relate, Challenge, Resolve. And this framework ties together these two skills very, very effectively. So the idea of relate, challenge, resolve is any story will always start with someone that you can relate to in a situation that you can relate to. And if you think of any kind of Disney movie, for example, um, children love Disney movies, and let's be honest, we adults love Disney movies as well. And Disney is an extremely successful company. And is it any coincidence that um, they put out these movies and so many people love these Disney movies? It's not a coincidence at all. It's all by design because they have all of these executives doing a lot of market research, trying to understand the life experiences most of their audiences have had, trying to understand the things their audience values. Mm. And when they are thinking about princesses, for example, they are thinking about what little girls and their families are experiencing today and, and trying to find um, trying to find parallels that they can show in their movies. And so Disney movies, any kind of successful movie is so successful because it relates to the audience. It talks about things that the audience knows they have experienced and they can understand. So the beginning part of a story is relate. And the next part of a story is after we've seen a person in a situation that we can relate to, then they encounter a challenge. And the challenge is where their world has changed. And again, that word change, which is so fundamental to a story. And the challenge creates pain and we relate to their pain. And in the end, resolve, there is a resolution in the story. So relate, challenge, resolve is the structure of a story, but also you can use relate, challenge, resolve to persuade people. When you want to persuade or influence people, one of the first things you need to do is you need to relate to them. You need to understand where they're at right now and what are they thinking right now? What what are their beliefs right now? Um, this is one of the biggest challenges I found that Chinese leaders uh, I work with have because uh, they don't understand why their foreign colleagues think this way about e-commerce platforms, for example. They really struggle to relate. And before they even try to change their colleagues' minds, they need to first understand what do they actually believe in? What, why do they believe this? Uh, what stories have they heard about this? So start by relating. And a, a very good indicator for when we're relating to people is that they are nodding their heads. When you see them nodding their heads enough, 
but the sign that you are relating enough to them. And then when you are relating enough to them, you can challenge their beliefs. You can point out flaws with their beliefs, point out why um, just selling on a website in China is, is not going to work and suggest alternative things for them to believe. And that's when you start to change their mind. And then the final part is resolve. So with resolve, you want people to take action. It's exactly the same in a, in a story. You know, they, a character encounters a challenge. They have to overcome it with action. What is the action that will resolve the challenge? And so when you want to persuade people, you need to talk about the actions that they need to take in, in order to, to embrace this change. So relate, challenge, resolve works in exactly the same way for telling stories and influencing people as well. And, and the number of parallels between them is uh, there's just so many. <laughs> and that, that's really why I think of storytelling is the, the language of the mind. Uh, if you can understand how a story works, you can understand how the mind works. It's incredible, isn't it, when you think about sort of the real benefits of storytelling habits, because when you're sort of in a leadership position and you're sort of engaging other leaders or even your colleagues, you can do just that through it, can't you? You can engage them, you can get their attention, you can get them sort of hanging on every word you say. And then once you sort of are in that position, you can challenge them, you can sort of look to resolve things. I mean, those are really sort of the real benefits, I think, if we were to talk about that, that you can sort of bring to your daily work through the power of storytelling. Absolutely. Um, I, and I really do think that relate is the, the biggest thing a lot of leaders need to learn. Uh, if they can learn how to better relate to the people that they are leading, um, not only will they make people's heads nod, uh, they will have people with tears welling up in their eyes and they will have people's commitment because when you know that someone gets you, someone understands where you're coming from, uh, all of a sudden you, you relax and you listen to them wholeheartedly. Uh, and so relating is, is one of the absolute best skills uh, that I think, I think leaders can, can develop. And, and, and to relate, there, there are some simple habits that you can develop. One is to just shut up. <laughs> Stop mm. talking so much and, and start listening to people. Start listening to, um, you know, what experiences people have had uh, and what they think about things and why they think about things, why they think that way. Another habit is to ask more questions, especially questions like, what do you mean by that? To really understand what, what something means to them. And, and then um, finally, once, once you understand what, what things mean to them and what things are important to them, what you really want to do with relating is say things that align with their beliefs and make their heads nod and really target their heartstrings. Because when you can show that you relate to them, you are in a much better position to start changing their minds and, and influencing them. Absolutely fantastic. And your upcoming uh, book, of course, The Story Habit, is all about sort of simplifying that storytelling process. Um, I can imagine, of course, it talks an awful lot about that sort of relate, challenge, resolve framework that we've talked about. But in what other ways would you say, Jamie, that without obviously giving too much away before the book comes out, would you say that it sort of simplifies the art of storytelling for those that read it? Mm. So one way... In, in particular, um, it, it is this habit of noticing change, which is actually the, the first, uh, the first story habit that I mm. talk about in the book. And, um, the way it works is, is like this. If you want to become a skilled storyteller, you need to have, uh, well, you need to practice telling stories. If you want to practice telling stories, you need to have stories to tell. And if you want to have stories to tell, you want to have, a, you know, what we call a story pool, uh, a, a little memory bank in your memory of all of these different stories that you can pull out at any time. And the way to develop that is to just pay more attention to the changes that happen in your everyday life. 
And when you notice a change, that can go into your story pool. And the next time you're in a situation where you need a story, maybe you are trying to persuade a customer, maybe you are trying to explain to one of your team members how the strategy is going to work, or some kind of situation like that, you can pull out that story to use in that moment and, um, and, and make things clearer for them. And when we tell a story for the first time, I, I, it's not really the best time. Um, it, it's never, it's never the best, uh, the best version of the story we tell. The best version of a story we tell is a story we told lots and lots of times repeatedly and refined each time we told it. And when we practice telling the same story, we get better at telling the same story. And if we get better at telling that story, we get better at telling stories in general. And this all comes from just that simple habit of noticing changes that happen in everyday life. So once we just start paying more attention to the changes that happen in everyday life, uh, you can build upon that and build a story pool, start using those stories, start refining those stories, and all of a sudden, you're a really skilled storyteller. And you can start enjoying the benefits of, of storytelling. And it, like I say, once you master that skill, you close that real gap of understanding, which is so critical to so many problems. And all of a sudden, that leadership team that struggles to sort of get people to buy into what they're doing, that's no longer an issue. All of a sudden, you start to really close those cultural differences. So the benefits of this are, are huge, aren't they, when you sort of really master that habit. And uh, for anybody who is interested in uh, sort of looking more into what we've discussed on the uh, the podcast uh, today, Jamie, I think I'm right in saying that shapingpaths.com is the uh, the website to go to, isn't it? Yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, you can also follow me on uh, LinkedIn, uh, Jamie Dixon, uh, if you want to learn more as well. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, just before we do finish up, uh, Jamie, it's been um, really enthralling having you on the uh, the podcast today, but I am conscious that we are beginning to uh, run slightly short of time. Um, what are some of your sort of plans for the next 12 months as you continue to really sort of drive storytelling training forward? I can imagine you've got plenty uh, to uh, to get stuck into. Yeah, uh, so this year is a, is a very big year for me. Uh, I've been in China for 15 years and I'm planning on moving back to the UK uh, in early 2023, um, but lots and lots of reasons, but, uh, time to, time to go back home. Uh, so, um, part of the plan to move back home is the story habit, um, mm-hmm. working with all of these Chinese leaders and helping them with the, the really big challenges they've had with influencing their colleagues overseas, um, from here has led to the story habit. And I'm looking forward to sharing that with a wider, more international audience as well. So uh, I will be moving back to the UK or be bringing the story habit with me back to the UK. Um, And I'm also going to be uh, licensing uh, the story habit uh, program uh, to other trainers and coaches uh, who want to uh, use it with their team members or or with their clients as well. So uh, that's a a big focus of mine for, for the next 12 months. Absolutely amazing, and uh, I do wish you all the luck in the uh, the world, Jamie, and being able to uh, sort of come back to uh, Europe and really sort of execute that plan to uh, to good effect. And I think as we sort of start to see how that's panning out for you over the uh, the next couple of years or so. I'd actually relish the opportunity to even welcome you back onto the program just to see how that wider audience is embracing the uh, the storytelling concept because it's been really, really fascinating uh, having you on the show today to talk all about that and I hope that it goes uh, really well and it would be good to uh, to touch base again for sure. Thank you very much and very, very nice to speak with you as well today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an immense pleasure, Jamie. And uh, just before, of course, we uh, we do wrap things up, uh, please do take care and stay safe with all that's still going on in the world as well. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and you too. Thank you.
It was a real pleasure welcoming Jamie Dixon, coach, trainer and author, onto the podcast today to talk all about his upcoming book, The Story Habit, and what storytelling can do for leaders in today's day and age. Um, if you have been listening into today's programme and you feel you have your own tale of success and innovation to share with us here at the Leaders' Council, then by all means, we also want to hear your story. So why not apply to be on the show via leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply. Until next time, to all of our regular listeners, you've been listening to the Leaders' Council podcast with your host, Scott Chaloner. Please do take care and goodbye.